Hi everyone, my name is Don Otter. I'm calling in from over the seas at New Zealand, which is sort of not COVID free anymore, but we're not, we're not saying too much about it. I think we're almost in a state of denial, but we'll be catching up to you guys in Victoria and the rest of Australia fairly soon, I think. I'll be talking today about artificial milk, and I've posed the question, is it milk as we know it? And you'll understand why I say that uh, shortly. And I've also got another question here. Is it more than a, the sum of its parts? And again, this will, this will become obvious why I, I pose this question as well. Right. Normally what I like to do is start with a few questions just to see how much you know about the topic. So the first question is, how much do you know about artificial milk? What sort of fermentation is precision fermentation? How does that work? Also, what sort of milk components in milk are we looking at when we think about artificial milk? And what sort of products are the main products from precision fer fermenting? Then we think about cell culture. What sort of cell types do we use when we do cell culture to make artificial milk? And lastly, name some products that are on the market now. And I originally had product, but there's now this whole area is exploding so much that uh, there's now three products and I think another two just about to come on the market that I know about. So they're coming out every day now. Right, when we think about artificial, what is artificial? Um, mostly in the, in the food industry will know about Julian. He's um, been a commentator on food for the last 20 years that I know of. He said a hybrid or blended strategy gives flexitarian consumers permission to indulge in favorite foods like meat, dairy, and bakery. They can eat them and not feel guilty. Well, that's, that's, that's a, big, a big ask for things. Um, I'm not sure if I, I sort of agree with them, and, and, but I disagree with the sentiment. Um, talking with Jenny about the topic, she was quite interested in because as she said, it's always good to know who your competitors are. And obviously with dairy, we have competitors out there such as plant-based dairy, to which I say, is it dairy? And I've got a big nut. Nah. I'm not even gonna go there today, okay? So we're really only gonna be talking about milk dairy today. So I called it artificial milk. People don't like that name. And they still haven't come across a, 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 a moniker that they really want to pin on what is really, as they say, an artificial product. We've got Floramade, animal cell-free dairy, cell-cultured milk, um, all these fungal, algal, et cetera, based, fermentation-based, alternative protein, vegan dairy. This is going to be problematic, both for regulation and for marketing, about what these people call their product. In the US, they've basically given up on uh, not being able to call things dairy or non-dairy. The, the lobbying groups there are too big. Um, I know in Australia, there was a bit of a, a stink about some of these names of um, non-dairy milk, uh, liquid milks, et cetera. So that's going to be interesting to see what they come up, up with further down the road. But I always like to start with what is the definition of milk? And all you guys will know this. Lact uh, lacteal secretion, practically free of colostrum, obtained by the complete milking of one or more healthy cows, goats, sheep, water buffalo, or other hooved animals. So that's the legal definition as such. And you can say on the packet of something that's made with one of these is made with something milk, okay? So for me, that's what milk is, but I've been in the dairy industry too long and I'm also a grumpy old bugger. So that's just the way it goes. Right, milk. Whenever I do any, any talks or anything, I always ask how many components are there in milk? 
So what I'd like you to do is get on the chat and put a number down. I, I won't look at it now. We'll look at it later and we'll see who gets closest and I'll, I'll give you a bar of chocolate or something like that. So how many components do you all think are in milk? Individual components. Let's have a look, shall we? If we go to back to Bob Jenner's from many years ago, back in 88, when I was a young fella, may contain as many as 10 to the five different kinds of molecules. He, he might have a slight exaggeration, but that's a lot of different components in milk. And I, I'll tell you why this is important. Because some of them are, are well, to me, they're all important. They're all there for a reason. We've had evolution for long enough that, that you don't put things in just for the sake of putting them in. So for example, we've got over 500 proteins and enzymes that we know of. And I've just picked lactoferrin here as an example. You can see lactoferrin on the uh, right-hand side there. It's got lots of different activities associated with it. So even though it's a small percentage of the total milk, it's there for a reason and a very important reason. Milk fat globulin membrane as well. It's got lots of different components attached to that, and that's there for a reason. Um, peptides, bioactivity. We've got lipids, oligosaccharides, vitamins, small molecules, etc. So everything is there for a reason. And with something like oligosaccharides, for example, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, no one even talked about those. So we know there's lots there. We know there's a lot there as well that we don't really even know too much about at the moment. So this is, this is a good, this is what I love about milk. Right, what's in milk? We can do the simplistic 4411, fat, protein, carbohydrate, and, oh, sorry, 4441, and um, minerals, etc. Or we can delve deeper. So if we go into it deeper, we can look at cow's milk versus, say, human milk. they got roughly the same total solids, so you can say, oh, it's good. The fats, again, roughly the same. Protein, there's a lot less protein. We can then delve deeper into the protein and say, right, what part of that protein is different? And you immediately look at the casein versus the whey and say, oh, there's very little casein in human milk, whereas there's lots in cow's milk. Oh, that's good. Okay, we can look at that later on. You can say, but if we look at whey protein, it's the same concentration. So it must be the same. And when I started in the dairy industry, we would try to mimic cow's milk for um, human infant formula. And then you start saying, right, let's look at in the individual whey proteins, and you find they're completely different. So everything is never as simple as it seems. Similarly, with lactose, you have high levels of, of lactose in human milk compared with um, cow's milk. Okay, if we think about artificial milk, what sort of products are we going to make? When is milk milk? Do you have to have everything in it? Or can you just take one part of milk and say, right, this is milk? And I think this is a problem that we still, or, or a question that we still haven't really answered. And that's going to come up more and more in the future. So if we just do make the individual milk proteins, like the caseins or the whey proteins, can you consider that milk? And if we think about the caseins, we know there's four caseins, that's great, but there's a whole lot of different genetic variants of those four caseins. There's also different degrees of phosphorylation, different degrees of um, glycosylation. How does that all tie up into what we call milk? And then you have making a, a casein micelle. What caseins do you need to make the micelle? If we go into whey proteins, that's even worse than caseins because there's so many more of them. Um, 
then we can go into something like cheese and different formulas, some of the different products. What components of cheese do we need to have to, before we can call it a milk, a dairy cheese? And similarly for infant formula, et cetera. So we've got ingredients, human milk. Can we make human milk? And then there's always the oligosaccharides. So we talk about oligosaccharides. Um, we know that the human, human milk oligosaccharide is, is a lot different to the cow's milk oligosaccharides. So how can we relate one to the other if we're making a milk product? Right, let's see. How do we make these artificial milks? There's a number of different ways of doing it. And here's three that I've got here. Precision fermentation, cell culture, and plants. Okay, let's start at the top. Precision fermentation. If we look at the bottom there, this is a, a quick schematic. Search the animal genome for milk protein DNA. So you're gonna grab the DNA that you want for the milk component that you want to make. You're gonna throw that DNA into a yeast or bacteria or whatever you wanna grow it up in. Grow it up in a, a reactor of some sort. Extract out whatever protein you want and you can make vegan milk or you can put it into cheese. Okay, simple as that. And that's been done for ages. Um, we'll get on to some of the more specifics about doing that later on. So that's one way, that's precision fermentation. In this case, as I said, we get whatever protein, milk protein or whatever we want excreted by the cells. We have to understand that it's GMO. There's always gonna be an argument about whether it's really GMO because we've excluded one from the other. So there's no DNA in the actual final material, but that's, again, we're getting into ethics and semantics and things like that. Another way of doing it is cell culture. Cell culture, we can grab the cells that we want. We can put them into media, treat them nice and carefully and coax them to make whatever component we want to make. Okay, that's simple, uh, but not quite so simple. You've got costly media there. It has to be sterile. You have to try to keep those cells growing. At the proliferation stage, you have to put them in to make sure that they grow into this, the right cell type that you want. In this case, memories, uh, epithelial memory cells, so that they'll excrete milk. Hollow fibers are often used where you have the cells clinging onto the hollow fibers on the outside. You have the media going through them and you get the separation of the media theoretically from the milk. And so that makes it easier. And I can remember doing hollow fiber um, growing hybridoma cell lines oh, about 35 years ago now for um, monoclonal antibody production. So the technology's there, it's all good. And then the last one is plants. We can get plants to grow, uh, to grow and we put the genes in for the uh, particular protein or whatever that we want. And then those genes will be expressed in the plants. And I'll talk about that later as well. So that, those are the three main methods that I'll be talking about today. Okay, now a bioreactor or a plant or a hollow fiber cell isn't the same as a cow or a human. You don't just have the milk coming out of um, a milking machine or whatever. You have to do some downstream processing. This is important as I put there for safety, you want to make sure that the products you're producing don't have any contamination, contamination with them from, say, bacterial cells or the cell media. If you look at all the, all the literature out there, 
they sort of gloss over this side of it, but it is very important and it can be quite expensive. So you see their precision fermentation. The degree of downstream processing required is quite high. And um, with that comes functionality and cost. So again, there's always a, a give and take between production, downstream processing, and the final cost of your product. Okay, where did we start with all of this? As far as I can tell, um, well, we could go back further than 2014. Way back in the day, I can remember um, even in New Zealand, we had transgenic cows that were producing other, other um, proteins. But this is the first crowd that really started thinking about milk. And they were initially called moo-free. And uh, I'll let you guess why they call themselves moo-free. And then they went to perfect day. And I thought, where the hell do they get perfect day from? Obviously, moo-free may, may maybe have some funny connotations, but perfect day just seems rather bizarre. Excuse me. Um, they went the precision engineering way. Using yeast, and this is this is their their own words. Genetically engineered yeast produce six key proteins that provide the texture and plant and, and then plants to harvest eight fatty acids that is to contribute to the flavor. Then they add the sugars and minerals, and they've got milk. And they, they added the easy peasy themselves. And there's, there's a, they've all got lovely photos to show what they can do. So that's brilliant. Um, that's milk. Simple as that. Six key proteins and eight fatty acids. Add some sugar and you've got milk. They've done a brilliant marketing job. I'll have to say that. In the last eight years, they're up to, well, in, in our currency, it's about a billion dollars. That is, that can make, that can produce a lot of science. They've selected the name Flora Made. Um, why Flora Made? They, I think they thought that sounded quite neutral. Um, Flora made protein, so they're really still going after the protein, the simple parts. They use fungi, yeast, and bacteria, but at the moment, the, the, the fungi, the trichoderma, is the first one that they're using. As I mentioned before, just add the DNA sequences. They can use 3D printing to make those sequences, put them in, and then you end up with your product. Um, again, they say we can provide the unique functionality and the nutri nutrition that you need. And they're going to pl start playing with fats as well in the future. So most of the ones that I'll talk about today, they're really only playing with the protein. What have they done so far? Mainly beetle egg is, is all they've really worked on. They're also working on a cheese. They've got ice cream out there. And just last week, I think it was, they started talking about gelato and shelf-stable mixes for ready-to-bake desserts. So they're really going after ingredients. And their, their way to market is as an ingredient supplier for other people to make the final products. And good um, Silicon Valley, I suppose you'd say, um, style. They've gone after sustainability. They've got ISO certified. This is really only for the whey protein production. And they can show, oh, it's so much better for water, energy, and greenhouse gas consumption. Uh, who cares? So that's just one example of precision engineering. If we go to the other side of it, which is cell culture, the first crowd that really worked on cell culture were Turtle Tree out of Singapore. They've since gone over to the, to the US. 
what they were looking at is extracting stem cells from breast milk, inducing them to become mammary epithelial cells so that they, those cells will actually churn out, as they said, real film milk. And to me, this is more like milk, okay? You've got the fats, you've got the bioactive proteins, the oligos. You've got lots of different components there. You just haven't got two or three proteins and said that's milk. It's obviously a lot more difficult. You have to put them, as I said, into some sort of bioreactor. In this case, they're using the hollow fibers, um, five liter hollow fibers that they scale up to a thousand or 50,000 liters. But with it, you have to try to make those cells last. You can't, you, once you've grown the cells up, you want that production to go for a long time. You can um, harvest the final product free of cells, and you have to make sure you've got no media or waste there as well. And that was a big thing I found 35 years ago. You have to look after those cells really well to keep them alive. Now, I'm sure things have changed a lot, so it's a lot easier to do it now, but it's still, media is very expensive. And what you're looking at here is the components in milk that are produced by the mammary cells, okay? So they do acknowledge that proteins, for example, that come out of the bloodstream, like the uh, immunoglobulins, they're not gonna be in their product. BSA probably won't be in their product either. And they admit to that. What they wanna do is they're going after infant formula. So, in, in an ideal scenario, they'll take, they'll take a biopsy from individual women, perhaps one, ones that can't breastfeed or whatever. And then within a couple of weeks, they'll be able to make uh, milk for their babies. That's, uh, that's a very expensive way of doing it. At the moment, they've, I think like all these companies, they have brilliant dreams to start off with and then reality hits. So they've actually come out with a um, lactoferrin problem, a product that we'll talk about later. Um, and, but they're also thinking about what products they can produce. And, and we'll talk about what sort of products they've got in mind. Um, this is another crowd, BioMilk. This is out of is Israel. And they do the same with uh, epithelial cells. They don't give too much away about, about what they're doing. They say no media bath or filtration needed. And they say that because they're just in competition with um, uh, turtle tree. Not cells grown in the lab, but rather cells produced by cells kept alive in a lab. And I'm thinking, well, what the hell is the difference between those two? I don't, I'm not quite sure about that. Um, Again, they want to look at human breast milk as well. And they're going after that human milk. So they're very similar to turtle tree. Now, the last one I haven't talked much about is the uh, using plants. And there's three companies looking at making, uh, putting the genes of, in this case, it's the whey proteins and the caseins into plants and basically milking the plants at the end of the day. And I'll talk about some of the, the uh, problems with that as well. So we've got the three different methods. Who's doing what out there? And if you look at this, don't worry about this. There's lots of information here. This is just to give you an idea that there's lots of people out there now. And I could add another two that I found just in the last couple of days that we just announced that they're going into the area. Um, really, there's, there's big money being thrown at some of them. Some of them are, have got the backing of big companies like General Mills, et cetera. What are they making? Some of them don't really say too much about what they're making. A lot of it is casings for cheese. There's a bit of lactoferrin, osteopontin. 
What I liked was the sugar logics who are making human oligosaccharides. That's, that's good. They're making something that I think is quite important. Um, casings. Yeah, I, I do wonder about some of these things. Um, down the bottom there, there's three Australian companies that have jumped into this. And these are all, this has all happened in the last uh, year or so. Change Foods, All G Foods and Eden Brew. They've managed to attract a bit of money between them. Most of them are going after caseins, whey proteins or liquid milks. So I think they're at the level of development now where they just trying to figure out where, what they're going to go after and, and see really where the, I suppose, where the, the best options are and how well the technology goes. So it'll be interesting to see how they get on. Okay, so if we think about cell culture, we've, I've talked about turtle tree, bio milk. There's also another bio milk. Sorry, that I mixed them up the other day uh, before. Biomilk from Israel is um, with a K. They're going after different things. Turtle tree dairy ingredients. Um, Biomilk and biomilk are both infant formula and breast milk. And there's also 108 Labs who's looking at, looking at, the, at the antibody side of it as well. So for them, I think that, that's quite neat that they, they recognise that there's a problem there with the antibodies. So they're actually going after that as well as the other. Okay. Um, it's very hard to get anything out of these companies. Obviously, it's a very early in the stage of the development, so they're not telling you anything. But we do know that the cell culture is expensive and we know that Reactor design is everything. A lot of these cells grow as monolayers, so you have to have a, a high surface area, and you have to be able to get rid of all the waste products from around them. They don't want to. They don't want to wallow in their own excrement, as it were. Um, they have to make a product. They have to sell the product. They have to try to convince people that it's something that you want. So one of these companies, Formo, have, have done a, a survey around the countryside. They state, they've actually published this. People are actually surprisingly open to buying cheese featuring dairy products made by microbes after they've read detailed description. So it's, it's, yeah, I think they're getting there. And this is all the, all the graphs that they showed, the, the willingness to buy and the willingness to try because, um, and they found that one sort of mirrors the other. They looked at a, a number of different companies, uh, countries, sorry, and they found that the acceptance of some of these products depends on the country. And you can see the US is down to only about two thirds, whereas India is somewhere up about 95%. Um, they also compared it with sow cultured meat. And they found cheese, animal, they sent it on cheese because that's what they made. Animal free cheese, cheese is is um, more widely accepted than cell cultured meat. But it's like all these things, as I put down the bottom, it depends on how you ask the question. What about regulations? FDA for, this is for perfect day. No questions, objections letter from the FDA. That's for BDLAC under grass, okay? Neither the FS, FSA or the EFSA have approved any of these ingredients so far. And I think more of these companies are going to the US because it's a, a friendlier, shall I say, regulatory environment to start playing with some of these products. Right. 
This is what some of the advantages stated by all the, in all the literature say. No cows is a big one. Environmental, land use, water use, energy efficient, they are all big selling points. They've got the customized end products there. And I put that in because, again, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a moving marketplace still. You have to see what price points you can get for your different products, what products you can actually make, and what products will the customers buy. Opportunities. Now, these are some opportunities that, that aren't really quite obvious, but um, when you think about it, no antibodies and no microbes. Okay, sorry, oh, I made a mistake there. That shouldn't be antibodies. It should be antibiotics. I apologize. And no antibiotics and microbes. That's a huge advantage theoretically. But when you think about it, with the quality control we have in place at the moment, that's not really a problem with most of the dairy products. Uh, this is one other that was quoted. Elderly people and cancer patients can drink some of these components that are made in breast milk and they're really good for them. So if we can mimic what's out there, it should be good. Bioactive proteins, complex sugars, etc. So, I mean, everyone's getting older, and the idea here, this is out of coming out of turtle tree, that there are some good components in milk that we can use for the elderly, for example. What are some of the problems? Translational modifications, post-translational modifications, glycosylation, phosphorylation. Do you get those same levels when you make the proteins in either bacteria, fungi, or plants? The minor components, the bioactives, if you're just making, um, say you're using precision, uh, engineering fermentation, you're not getting those bioactives. 3D structure. Can you make a micelle, casein micelle? And good, it's good that Rodzi, he'll be able to ask that question. As long as you've got some uh, calcium and some phosphate and probably just um, alpha S1 with lots of um, phosphoserines and Kappa casein, I'm sure you can probably make quite a, a decent casein micelle. I know I've read that you don't need all the caseins, but I haven't tried it myself, so that'll be interesting. And how does it affect the functional properties of the final cheese, if that's what you want to make? GMO, is it or not? It's produced by genetically engineered microbes but the microbes aren't in the final ingredients. So therefore, in some jurisdictions, you can claim that it's not GMO. Media costs, obviously for the cell culture, that's gonna be high. Customer perception. There's still this, this whole Franken milk type thing. You're playing with nature and you're not gonna convince some people no matter what. Regulations, again, that, that's, that's a mishmash all over the place. Bacterial cells, they can grow um, a lot faster than fungal systems, but then they require more post-processing after you've grown them. So there's lots of different things that you have to balance up. Precision fermentation, expensive at large scale. You've got to have sterility. You've got to have oxygen levels. You've got to get rid of your byproducts. You've got to keep your microbes growing. You've got to make sure they don't mutate. And here's one quote, casein is an inherently difficult protein to express 
So the yields are low and the cost structure is high. So there's lots of different problems out there, but I'm sure they'll be going, cutting through that list as we speak. With the sow culture, the media again is very expensive. So the cost of production, unless they can get this down, is, is going to be very high. Scalability, you can see they had to, the bioreact is, it's, when you're doing animal making, uh, sorry, growing animal cells, it's not the same as bugs because of the monolayer type um, requirement. And then you have to be able to harvest the product and theoretically try to keep those cells alive for as long as you can. There's more, more and more of these companies are talking about artificial intelligence, cellular agriculture, automated factory systems, blah, blah, blah. Those are, those are just, for me, they're buzzwords that everyone should be doing, but they're trying to get some sort of uh, marketing advantage over their, their competitors. So let's think about what is happening in Australia. As I mentioned, we've got three startups, Eden Brew, Change Foods, and All G Foods. Let's look and see what they're doing. Eden Brew. The first I could hear uh, that I could find from them was in July of this year. So that's only a few years, uh, sorry, a few months old. CSIRO, so Rod will know again all about these, and they've um, partnered with Norco, which is obviously a big dairy company. They state they know how to produce a casein micelle, and that's that's a big thing. If you want to, if they're going after the cheese, they have to get that micelle. They've also say they've got the flavour and texture to create the animal-free dairy. And and if you if you're doing it in bugs, obviously you don't have to have the lactose in there, and you don't have to have um, cholesterol in there. And it's frothy, creamy, milky taste, low allergenetic. The allergenetic is an interesting one, and I'll come. I'll talk a wee bit more about that later. And there's just a couple of photos of some of their products. Change foods. This has come out of Queensland University of Technology, but they've now moved over to the US. They've got a bit of money behind them as well. Sorry, if we just go back. Um, Eden Bruce also got 4 million behind them, and I'm sure they'll be looking after looking at more money as well. So there's good, a good bit of cash out there to help them along. Change Foods is going after cheese. Real dairy cheese without the cows, using, as I mentioned before, you've got your yeast, your bacteria, and your fungi. They state they're going after cheddar, mozzarella, and, and parmesan, and again, lactose-free and hyperallergenic options. And they're doing just the standard um, DNA sequences into bugs and growing them up. So they're following the crowd, I think, a lot. I don't know how they'll, what they've got that will give them an advantage over some of the others. All G Foods. All G Foods, they um, have already gone into the meat side of things. Now they thought they'd get into dairy. They've got a, a good chunk of funding there. A lot of their technology came out of University of Sydney. And again, this is only a month or two old. September, so that's only yeah, two months. They're also using precision fermentation. And they're going after casein proteins, as most of the others are. They also talk about going after milk cell, which is precision fermentation alternative dairy. So they have a photo there of a, a bottle of milk. Whether they're really going after uh, the whole uh, dairy product, I'm not sure. So good on them, they're, they're getting in there with all the rest of them. Right, let's see what products are out there. How are we going for time? Oh, that's good. This is Brave Robot. This is a 
really a company that was formed by Perfect Day, but is separate to Perfect Day, and they're making ice cream, lots of uh, ice cream. This is all their blurb they have. Cow way, plant way, our way, both sustainable and tasty. Cows taste a bit unsustainable. Milk sustainable, not tasty, blah, blah, blah. So it goes on and on. I like the one over on the right-hand side. Yes, it's way. It isn't like dairy. It is dairy without the cows. Okay, so they're talking about way here. Microliferal plants, fermentation, non-animal whey proteins, they all come together as brilliant ice cream. Oops, went the wrong way, sorry. Um, what is ice cream? Ice cream contains fat, which is normally milk, cream, butter, or vegetable fat, water. Milk solid is non-fat, which is protein, lactose, and solids, and then some sugar, emulsifier stabilizers, and some air, and then obviously all your flavor ingredients, etc. The top one is quite important for me. So I just had a look at, at um, a local brand, local tip top ice cream. Ice cream contains a minimum of 10% milk fat. Where's that milk fat coming from? If we go over to the left to Brave Robot and look, we've got coconut oil, sunflower oil. And then we've got a whole lot of uh, maltodextrin, natural flavor, vanilla bean, that's fine, calcium phosphate, uh, potassium phosphate citrate, disodium phosphate, carabine gum, mono and diglycerides. So that's got a lot of things in it. Admittedly, other ice cream's got lots of things in it too, but it's got cream, milk, and milk solids, non-fat. Um, I do have some problems here, but they can call it ice cream for a start, because it doesn't have 10% uh, milk fat. I don't know what the, the US regulations are, but in New Zealand, you wouldn't be able to call that ice cream. There's also warnings down the bottom, contains milk, non-animal whey protein. So I'm not really too why they chose Betalac to put in it. It's probably just the easiest protein to make, whey protein. But you have to think about Betalac. There's no Betalac. Um, I suppose it's, it's, it's in there for functionality, that's all. It's a very small component. If you look at the milk solids non-fat, it's about say 30 or 40% of that. So the total protein is very small compared with all the other components. And the other components like the total fat and the sugars have nothing at all to do with dairy. So what can you call it? They've also just come out with a new product, cream cheese which I thought was even better. If you look at cream, cream cheese, look at um, a typical Philadelphia cream cheese. How is it made? You start with fresh cream, a combination of milk and cream, add lactic acid bacteria, that's fairly standard, lower the pH, and that causes curds to form. The whey gets drained, the curds get heated, and then you add sta stabilizers for structure. So here's just a, a label for Philadelphia cream cheese. It contains pasteurized milk and cream, salt, carob bean gum, that's for the stabilizer, and um, cheese culture. What have we got on this other one? We've got a whole list there. Animal, animal free, sorry, I have to shift this so I can see. Animal free cream. What is animal free cream? That's just the coconut oil and you've got a bit of whey protein. 
you've got all these modifiers, uh, starches, et cetera, to throw into it as well. You have to think, again, when we're talking about whey protein, cream cheese doesn't really contain any whey protein. Maybe a little bit gets caught up in the coagulum, et cetera, but there's not a lot. So um, I wonder why do we even need to add cream, add, um, if they want to make a, a cream cheese, what, just by adding a whey protein that wouldn't normally be there anyhow, and then saying that, that it's a, a dairy, it's milk based. And to me, that's nonsense. Anyhow, I'm a grumpy old bugger. So um, when, when I think about things, there's what's called the smell test. It's like when you smell food to see if it tastes any good. And I'm sorry, but for me, this doesn't pass the smell test. And the other test that I have is what I say to all my students, the so what test. They put whey protein in there. And my first question is, so what? It, it means nothing apart from the fact that they're adding a milk allergen in there. What can you say? Turtle tree. Now, you see, the cell culture people, I think, are, are going a bit further in the right way. They've finally come up with a product, and this just came out in the last couple of weeks, human lactoferrin. And again, as I mentioned before, using mammary gland cells, blah, 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 filter out the milk, make the, get the final product. This is lactoferrin is good for everything. They're making something that makes sense to me. Okay. Pink gold, they call it. We, we make a lot of, uh, purify a lot of lactoferrin as well at the moment. We add it to infant formulas and they can do the same. So they've got a product there that is, is a real product and they're not making any bones about it. So I think I've probably been raving enough almost. So we'll go back to the start. What does precision fermenting use as a vehicle? And I want you all to put the answer down. What components of milk are, we, are they targeting in artificial milk? What's the main final product for precision fermenting? Name the cell types and what products are in, in the marketplace now. And in case you weren't listening to me, here's some answers. Okay, you can read those later on. And that's the end. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing. He says. As long as you open your chat box there, Don. Um, open the chat box. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have quite a few questions, folks. So um, can you please type in your questions now and Don can read them out. Can I just ask you a question while we're waiting? Um, in, the modern, in the modern kitchen product of the cream mm -hmm. cheese, it says that it's animal free. But then there's a warning at the bottom that it may it contains dairy. I mean that's yeah. that's just not right. No, it's it's called marketing, Jenny. Mm. Simple as that. Um, can the delicious flavour of pasture fed cow's milk be replicated in artificial milk? That is a lot of that comes from the fatty acids. They are throwing in plant oils, so that's not going to work. Do you think consumers are really going to be comfortable consuming these highly processed products? Uh, Melissa, Melissa, sorry, as long as you make them sound exclusive and special you'll get people wanting to buy them is there a significance between human lactoferrin produced via these methods and that from cow's milk as far as i know Ian, i haven't looked into it this only came out i only saw this about two days ago um, and they don't they don't show 
any specifications for the products, obviously, but if you're making them out of um, human cell lines, they should be exactly the, the same as hum, human lactoferrin. And there are slight differences between human lactoferrin and cow's milk lactoferrin, but uh, there's difference in the protein, et cetera, and the glycosylation, but the bioactivity they've shown is, is feel very similar. What can you tell us about the waste streams from these processes? The waste streams from any fermentation, you can use the, uh, the old cells as feed, perhaps, but maybe if uh, GMO, there might be restrictions around that. There, there's gonna be huge waste streams. If, with the cell culture, there'd be waste streams as well. Obviously, um, all the metabolism products from the cells as they keep growing. Uh, what happens to them? I'm not really too sure, I'm sorry. Would these artificial milks be a benefit to people with food allergies such as milk protein and lactose? You are making the milk protein, so it depends what milk proteins you, you make. Uh, if, you, if you specifically made alpha lac, you could lower the, um, the problem with allergies. And if you targeted the specific proteins that had the lowest allergies amongst people, then that would help. Lactose is just a sugar. They're not adding lactose, so that's not a problem. And also lactose is intolerance. It's not an allergy, but that's by the by. Hi, Don. It seems the main challenge in producing dairy product is scaling. Yes, that's true. I agree. And if so, do you see this changing anytime soon? Um, you know, this is an interesting one because it's the same as milk versus meat versus um, plant proteins, etc. There's the big argument that it takes a lot of grass to, to grow to make milk and meat. So if we can do it in a, a bioreactor, we might be able to do it cheaper. I haven't seen any really good stats on that. Um, I showed you some on the sustainability, but I haven't seen um, that's one paper, one interpretation. Uh, evolution's been doing this for a long time. So, oh, yeah, it, I, to me, it, it still seems a very, um, a very expensive way of doing it for, for huge volumes. But it, they're going after niche, niche markets of people who will pay a lot of money. So for them, it probably, probably is competitive. But when you've been, when you've got the capital behind you of 750 million, um, these people presumably want a return at some stage, and I'm not sure how they're going to get it, to be fair. Would there not be a high return for bioactive proteins rather than proteins for food applications? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I understand what you're saying, Clinton, here, and I agree entirely. I, I'd be going after some of these bioactors as well. Uh, and then going after ones to put into the likes of infant formula. I don't know why they're going after casein for cheese. I really did. Um, yeah, presumably they can see a market out there. Yeah, it just, it does seem rather bizarre for me. Uh, lactoferrin is an interesting one. The lactoferrin is almost a commodity now. And so they, they really have to get out there and prove that their lactoferrin is better for the babies than um, bovine lactoferrin, or else that they'll be getting into the commodity market soon. Osteopontin, yeah, that's a good one to go after, I think. I like the ones that were going after the oligosaccharides because obviously the, the, the oligosaccharide profile in human milk is, is way different, way different. Um, what would I be going after? 
I agree with you. I think I'd be going after some of the more niche products. I, I love the, I love the, the the cell culture way of of helping women that can't breastfeed. One thing that, that they have admitted to as well is is breast milk changes throughout the lactation cycle, and it's very hard to do that. Obviously, there's the big IgA versus IgG. If you're trying to do the um, the cow's milk versus the human milk. And the, 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 whole, the whole protein makeup is completely different. Okay, looks like I've run out of questions. Thank you. Yeah. So very good, Don. A nice lot of questions there to finish off with. And um, that's terrific. Thank you all for attending today. And thank you, Don, for all the effort you've put into this presentation. If anyone has further questions over the coming week or so, you're welcome to email Don. His email will be is included in the um, Zoom recording link that I'm sending you, but also it's on the front of his PDF that I sent through this morning. Okay, so with that, we'll say thanks very much and we'll see you all next week. Mm -hmm.